everybody has something going on in their life. Even even people without kids, everybody has something going on in your life. So being empathetic to the different scenarios they may have, that was for me. And still since that day, I question consistently what I'm doing and if I'm putting enough time towards the most important things in my life. Hello and welcome to the Delivering Value Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Kaplan, and today I am very excited to share my conversation with John Short. John is the founder and CEO of an agency called Compound Growth Marketing, growth marketing agency. He's also a mentor to other folks who work in tech and an advisor to other SaaS companies. And prior to starting his own business, John was a regular in the Boston tech scene. He did growth at Workable. He led marketing at Yesware. He was a growth marketer at LogMeIn, kind of were his stints before starting his own gig. And originally, I was excited to chat with John and explore how you bounce back from getting laid off. Initially, that was the main focus of our conversation. We were going to talk about the emotional and confidence hits that can happen when you get laid off from a tech company and the hit to your identity that comes along with that. But what's interesting is during our conversation, I had a personal emergency. My son was at daycare. I have a two and a half year old son and he tripped and he fell and he hit his head on a bookshelf, cut his head open and his daycare texted us and said that they weren't sure if he was concussed and that we needed to come get him and maybe take him to the doctor. So I had a personal emergency. I jumped off the pod with John. And when we picked back up our conversation, we took it in a different direction. Because John has two young kids, he knows the struggles that parents have balancing work life and home life, how it feels when you get one of those texts, and how having kids changed the way that we think about our careers and our ambitions and what's really important to us. So we went deep on that topic. I think it'll be interesting to anyone who has a family, is thinking about starting a family, or maybe even works with a teammate who has a young family to understand what it's like and what they might be going through. I think you'll enjoy it. This episode of the Delivering Value podcast is brought to you by Novatic. If you're listening to this and you have followed me online, it should be no surprise that Novatic is a sponsor. I talk about the interactive demo space all the time. As a former two-time head of growth, I learned pretty quickly that there's a huge percentage of signups that create an account, poke around for a couple minutes, and leave and never come back. If you survey these folks, they usually say, Hey, I just wanted to see the product in action for a few minutes. I'm not ready to buy. I don't want to upload my stuff. I just wanted to see it. And so creating some version of your product that's ungated, that people can play with on your website, tends to be super helpful for that population of people. It increases the quality of your users. It weeds out all the clunkers, so from clouding up your data. And it starts the onboarding process way before someone even gets into the product. It's a huge part of the growth operating system. And if you're looking for help building this, so you don't have to take months and months doing it in-house like my engineers did, use Novatic. They create third-party tools that help you do exactly this. I send a lot of my advising clients their way, and they're a great product. Want to take a second and thank Mad Kudu for sponsoring the show. The average SaaS business has a hybrid motion these days. You know, when I was head of growth at Wistit and at Postscript, although we called ourselves PLG, there was a sales team at both companies. Both companies did some outbound. We did inbound. There was the product-led freemium or free trial motion and wrangling all that stuff to understand lead scoring and quality and PQL routing is a bear. And when I worked at PostScript, we had a Stanford PhD, had a PhD in data science, one of the smartest people I've ever met, spend weeks and weeks and weeks putting together this insane predictive model using our behavioral data to understand who was likely to convert and to upgrade. And it took weeks of doing this. We weren't really able to adjust it after the fact, and it ended up being something that was hard to maintain. And what's great is that now there's these whole suite of tools out there that can help you do this way faster. So Madkudu is typically the one that I send my clients to that if I had in my previous world, those head of growth would have made my life way easier. And what's nice is that they balance the hybrid motion really well. So if you're trying to wrangle PQLs, PQAs, and figure out lead scoring across your hybrid model, check out Madkudu. It's where I send my clients. Two summers ago, my daughter was in summer school and we got a call that she had had a seizure at school. And so she had never had a seizure before. I hardly knew what it was, but I got the call and immediately just like ran out of my office to go home, to get the car, to, to go get my kid. And I think it just, 
speaks to the challenges of parenting. You know, the distraction from work started there, but it didn't end because then there were trips to the children's hospital, testing, all of that kind of stuff. And I think that's been one of the most difficult challenges since having kids that I've had to come across is like that balance. We didn't know that she would have seizures. She still only had one. It's been two years, but it did take us down the path to learning more about why she was developmentally delayed. And I say that, I talk about this because it is often brought into my mind of like having a daughter who's just, who's going to require extra support for myself. It's brought into my mind, like how I think about planning for retirement, but also what I should be doing right now. Am I focused on the right thing? Before starting my own company, my life was very much dedicated to my job. I was going into work every day, spending most of my day there. I was coming back. You know, if something came up at work, that took priority in terms of seeing my family, dinner, those types of things. And since starting my own company, I've started to look at the world with more of like a portfolio view of there are many different things that make up my life. And the most significant change to that view was kids coming into my life. It's no better gift about what's important, right? I feel like I went through the same thing where I identified as a guy who worked at a tech company who led a growth, like that was a big part of my identity. You literally wear it on your chest, right? We wear the t-shirts for you having your own business. For me, when my when my son was born, I was working in house, and then you realize what's really important. Like it's not in the cloud, it's not some SaaS thing. It's your family. Like what a gift, you know. But that is a change for a lot of us, for sure. Before we keep going, your daughter is okay. She had one seizure, but she's okay. She is. She's speech delayed and she's physically delayed. And so for me, the question is always, where should I be spending? more of my time and what would be the most valuable usage of my time? You know, I, I often question what I should be doing during the day or what I should be working towards being able to do five years from now, four years from now. It's a big part of the equation of why I do what I do. I mean, when I started compound growth, I wrote down and I recommend this to everybody. When I was in a career transition, I wrote down the reasons why I was doing what I was doing. One was to spend more time with family because that was really the challenge that I was having at the point of, in the point of time when I decided to go out on my own. Two was work on intellectually stimulating projects. And three was focus on my health, my mental health and, and physical fitness and all those types of things. So I think I'm the only person to ever start a business with the first goal being spend more time with family and the third goal to <laughs> to have better mental health. But I've seen a lot of people actually be able to do that successfully. But so it has, kids have changed the career arc for me. And it doesn't mean that you need to go out and start your own business. But I do think we'll see shifts in how companies work as, you know, millennials get into executive level roles more inside of companies. And as millennials have continue to have more kind of, they're really sought after class right now in terms of talent, or they're really sought after cohort in terms of talent. How do how has your work shifted since your son has come into the picture? Like, how do you think if you were still in house, that would impact how you were working and how you viewed your work. I was struggling, dude, when my son was born. So I was, my son was born in November, 2021 in the height of the pandemic craziness. And I was still relatively new at a job. I remember I was at PostScript and when I interviewed at PostScript, my wife and I were ready. I can't remember if we were trying to start our family or if we just talked about it, but I was transparent with them because I was the 10th hire. And I knew what it was I was signing up for as the 10th hire. And they had 
grown a lot and they had substantial results for such an early, you know, small team, but I knew what it was. So I had told them like, Hey, sooner than later in the next year or two, I'm going to be starting my family. If everything works out well and nature cooperates. And as part of that, I'm going to need to have balance here. And they were like, Oh, they were, the founders were so supportive. But then when my son was born, I was so burnt out, dude. And you know how it is when they're little and they're still waking up three times a night. It's like every couple of hours and you know, you're trading off with your partner. I mean, at least that's what we were doing. We were trading off. And so I was just so tired to start every day. And then I'd go and I worked at an early stage company. So I was exhausted. And so I just identified as like tired, anxious, burnt out version of me. It was not the best version of me. And my why was similar, dude. Like I, I had a different push, but I was like, man, I don't want to become this thing that I think I'm going to become if I keep going down this road. Like I work at an early stage company. My whole career has been kind of hustling and I don't think I can keep that up. I need to change something. And that was part of what spurred my why as well. Yeah. I looked up at the, you know, CMOs in the industry or at that role or looked at other people in the company I was at in C-level positions. And like, I just saw like there was a lot of, you know, the challenges that they were having or they were already through it. Having young kids was in the way in their rear view mirror. For me, the challenging points, and I don't know how to get through this, but I think, you know, my, my focus on switching jobs to improve mental health and physical health partly related to my kids, both of them, for whatever reason, from four months to eight months, and then my son from six months to 12 months, were waking up every hour. And uh, so, we... so brutal, dude, right? <laughs> so brutal. Yeah. And I just remember like my daughter, to get her to sleep, like we tried everything. So we don't need anything in the comments about, oh, you know, try this. No, I tried it. <laughs> I'd have to walk in her room, sing a very specific song or quote. Like I basically learned how to read Little Blue Truck with the lights off. Um, <laughs> but the memories I have from that time being in that room that was in our apartment in the city was sitting there late at night, wanting my kid to go to sleep, dreading the idea of having to get up early in the morning and thinking about some of the challenging, like really some of the challenging relationships that I was having at work, some of the stressful relationships that I was having with some of the counterparts that I worked with. And that like my mind just went to such a negative place at those when you're getting a little sleep, you really get into these negative cycles when you're literally getting three hours of sleep every night. And when you're getting up all the time and you never get to the deep sleep cycles that you need. And so those were the challenging moments. And, you know, for me, I don't just want to present the problem, I think, to, to everybody listening, but I it really helped for me to start reaching out to other parents who are going through similar issues and starting to hear about how they were coping with it. Or obviously I started my own business, which helped get me some flexibility in my life so I could still do some of the things that I needed to do outside of family and work just to feel balanced. And so those were the key moments for me in kind of figuring out what to do and coping with it because it can be so challenging. Did you have any mentors or people that you kind of looked up to that showed you what it could look like to work in tech and fast paced tech and still have a family? Yeah, I did. And I think I always like from the, from when I was like 27 on, I really started to focus on those people as the mentors that I was, I was looking for in my career. So that was definitely something that I was pretty alert to. So for reference, when I say 27, that probably means nothing to, to the people who are listening. I had my first kid when I was 31 or 32, somewhere, somewhere in that, that time range. I'm now 37. So I'm old enough to forget when I had my first kid, but you know, I started paying attention relatively early in my career to 
how people were coping with this and the types of people who I wanted to emulate and the, the types of mentors who I wanted to surround myself with. And then I, I think like I always found companies too that had pretty good work-life balance, but were still growing pretty quickly. I only worked for one company where I was the 10th employee and that was much earlier in my career. But even there, there was a lot of focus on family in that company because ultimately that was what it was all about for the founders. And did you seek that out or was that just luck that you happened to be there at that point in your career when you did start your family? I definitely seeked it out when looking for mentors. I'm not sure I seeked it out when looking for the companies that I was working at. So at one of the companies I worked at earlier in my career, I remember actually being a little bit turned off by, oh, the work-life balance and wanting the company to achieve more and see greater growth. And I regret that. It's tough. And, you know, understanding the perspective that the people had and it's just crazy, the system we've built where, you know, we have school that gets out at 3.30 and people are expected to stay at work much later than that. It is and, crazy. You know, even just like you think about it, healthcare benefits are tied to your company, but like daycare benefit or children's schooling is not at all tied to the type of benefits that you have for work. And, you know, it's really weird that healthcare and work go hand in hand together until recently, really. But it's crazy, you know, thinking about people who have to commute an hour to go pick up their kid every day. And that was a big consideration for us. We moved an hour outside of Boston. Well, when in pre COVID, like when we're in the city, and we hear about our kid getting a bump on the head and maybe needing to go to the hospital, are we going to be able to survive that one hour train ride home? And you know, not having complete flexibility on what, when we would get home. Like it's, it's crazy. The decisions that people were forced to make even pre COVID on how they were going to live their life, how they were going to balance everything. There's a woman on my team who had twins, twins that at the time were three or four, somewhere right around in that age. And I was newly married but none of my friends had really started having kids yet. So I didn't really know what her life was like. She had a big presentation one day and I was supporting her. And I said, oh, how are you doing? Like, I think we had a one-on-one -on -one before the presentation. And she said, you know, I've had a terrible morning, Andrew. My daughter got upset with me and pooped on the floor or pooped and stomped it around her room, basically. <laughs> it's what she told yeah. me. And she said, my daughter's old enough. She's potty trained. She knew better. She did it because I didn't give her a popsicle for breakfast or something. And I was like, oh, I have no idea what your life is like. Like, I just had this revelation that I was like, oh, yeah, that is really. T and she goes, look, I don't care how this presentation goes. However, it, go it could go horribly. It will be better than my morning. So whatever happens yeah. here is easy. And I was like, man, what a different perspective than the one that I have, which is this presentation for me, if I was in her shoes, would be the most important thing probably in my whole week. And so yeah. it's just this interesting gift where you get a different perspective. Do you have a version of that where your perspective changed sort of post-children versus pre-children? Yeah. I mean, it was such a big moment when I got called about my daughter having a seizure at school, but it had an impact on how I managed afterwards where everybody has something going on in their life. Even even people without kids, everybody has something going on in your life. So being empathetic to the different scenarios they may have, that was for me. And still since that day, I question consistently what I'm doing. And if I'm putting enough time towards the most important things in my life, that has been the big question and the kind of paradigm shift for me. The weeks leading up to the birth of our first child, there was also a shift. I remember switching my phone. So no matter what my wife's calls would get through to me, that was a pretty significant moment for me in starting to get out of this work first mindset and into more of the, okay, there's a lot more things that are going to be happening in my life 
So that was another moment. And then when the sleepless nights started to hit and understanding how important sleep, like the whole balance of everything in your life of sleep, family, food, working out and work, like the interconnection that those all played in terms of feeling well and, and being, and being happy. You mentioned it a few times today that you said, Hey, revisiting my balance of investing in the things that are most important to me is one of the ongoing challenges that I work through. Do you have a framework or a system or some way that you recalibrate there or that you use to calibrate there? No, I don't have a framework that I use for balancing the time that I spend across work, family, working out and all those types of things. I haven't found the perfect formula for that. One of the things I do do is I block my calendar from eight o'clock in the morning to nine 30 in the morning. And then from five to seven o'clock. And that has been a great forcing function for me. I'm also ADD. So like one of the reasons why I was able to survive and get through college was I had the cross. So I had this like limiting factor that forced me to focus on work when I was able to do work. And without that, I probably just would have been all over the place and never made time to do work because I, I would have had an infinite amount of time to do work. The constraint yeah, yeah. was helpful. And the same has been true when I block off my calendar at the end of the day and get home usually between five and five thirty every day. And then blocking off the morning, which I usually start working before nine thirty, but it gives me time to settle in because the time from when the kids wake up at six thirty to when we hand them off to childcare in the morning at 8 a.m. That is a wrestling match. And then from 5 to 5.30 when I get home every day to 7 o'clock at night, that is also a wrestling match. But I want to make sure that I'm present in those moments and enjoying those moments. And so there's no framework, but I am able to block off that time to make sure I get that time in. And then I also... And my wife helps me a lot with this, but we're always checking each other to make sure we're actually valuing the time with our kids rather than just spending large quantities of time with the kids. And we do that in various ways. Instagram is always a great reminder. There's the, the quote um, that's been going around recently that my wife brought up to me the other day of like, whenever you're angry, just close your eyes and picture what it's going to be like 40 years from now when you're in your eighties. And, um, you know, would you trade that moment to come back to this moment with your kids and enjoy that experience? I don't know who the quote was from. So I've seen it as well. I heard Alex Hormozzi talking about it. He wrote the hundred million dollar offers book. I heard him talking about it, but I don't know if it's his quote or if he just was talking about seeing it on Instagram. Too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But no, but I, I thought it was good. I think it's, there's, you know, balance, there's trying to figure out how to spend more time with your kids. There's understanding that work is a vessel to enable you to be able to raise your kids. But the the quality time too is is really important. To me, the thing that you just said is what resonates most with me, which is when our son was born, my relationship with work changed from being a core part of my identity and my fulfillment to being a tool or a vessel is what you said to spend more time doing the things that are important, which to me, we're spending time with my family. And that's a shift. And it's like a weird thing where I think some people sort of struggle with that or, or like they kind of have these two tugs or they feel like they're not doing either job well. To me, that's, right. what's, been, that's what's been really hard for me and also for my wife is like, I think our intentions are in the right place, but it sort of feels like no matter which side of the seesaw you feed that you're neglecting the other side. And that's been an ongoing challenge and something that we try to support each other with when we need to, but it's hard, man. Yeah. 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 It's really, I mean, that, that kind of change in your persona, how you view yourself is it, really challenging. Do you think the narrative has changed a little bit when I was, when I feel like I was coming up and we're the same age and I feel like when I was coming up and I was sort of in my mid twenties, it was work first was the vibe that I got. 
even people that yeah. had families, they worked the same hours. You know, if they came in and said, oh, I'm tired or sleepy today, it was sort of like, oh, that's too bad. And that I feel like now the narrative has changed a little bit, maybe because of the pandemic uh, and just more attention on mental health in general. I feel like there's a little bit more support now, but it also just might be that I'm at this stage. And I just, my eyes weren't open to it before. I think the narrative has changed. I have a theory about this. The millennials are the largest generation ever in the US. Second biggest is the baby boomer. So Gen X is between us or something like that. I listen, when we were coming up, I want to start this out by saying when we were coming up, when we were coming out of school and everybody said, oh, the millennials are next, the millennials like to do this. And now they're like, Gen Z likes TikTok. You know, they want to navigate this way, blah, blah, blah. I hated that stuff. But when you look at the generations for like the shifts that are going to happen over time, I don't know if you noticed this, but when my wife was pregnant and right before that, when our friends started to get pregnant, et cetera, you started to see more mocktails and bars. And I think all of these shifts are, and now there's been this move to the suburbs, which has kind of been covered up by COVID. Everybody's blaming COVID. I think it just accelerated the generational trend for the people who had kids to move out to the suburbs. And so I, I put a lot of that towards millennials kind of being the largest generation and moving through the different stages of their life. And at each one of those different stages, having the power to drive that kind of change because they created demand in the organization for more flexibility. They created demand at the bars for there to be more mocktails. They've created more demand at each of these different stages for these societal changes that we've been talking about. So if you think about it, when we were coming out of school, the baby boomers who were, who is the second largest generation ever were in the prime of their earning power. They were in their forties and fifties. And then the millennials kind of came in and started to change the narrative completely. I like the take. I don't know if it's right or wrong, <laughs> but I like it and I can agree with that. And look, yeah. man, uh, I'm right there with you. I live in Medford now. It's basically on the Somerville line. It's it's still the city. We're about to move to the Burbs. We've been talking about it for a year. We're ready. Our friends are mostly moving to the Burbs. So I could see that, that you've got this big population in the world and now they're maturing and they have needs and the companies are shifting to that. Like you could get me there. I, I could buy that. Yep. You could also easily get me to just be like, yep, well, you know, as you've changed, the things that you've needed have appeared in front of you. Or oh, so you know, your eyes have been open to the different needs that you have at that time. So yeah. I could go either way on it. Well, dude, thank you for coming on, sharing a little bit about your life and your family and some of the craziness that is raising these little creatures. For anyone who's listening, who's who's in that waking up every hour, what's the best sleep tip you got? Sounds like you've experimented with a few of the toys and tools and all that good stuff. What's your best tip? I would take a look at the snow. You can lease them now. I, we I was going to say they're it. pricey. Yeah, you can. We did resell ours for a pretty good price. So they hold their value. Oh, this one's a little cheesy. I did find like when I had a more positive attitude that the baby was able to settle quicker. And so I think like, I think the whole happy Gilmore thinking happy thoughts my theory behind this is that when you're holding the baby, they can sense tension in your body. And so as you're improving your mood internally and enjoying that moment, it actually relaxes a lot of the muscles in your body and creates a better environment for them. So that is actually the best tip that I have. And I found that to be true with both my kids. I think that's a really good tip. They know. They know when you're in a good mood. They know when you're stressed. Yeah. They can pick up yeah. on that. Like from a really yeah. young age. I do. Thanks for coming on. For those who are interested in connecting or following you, where should we send them? LinkedIn slash in slash John G Short. I'm creating content there pretty regularly. And then you can also check out compoundgrowthmarketing.com. You've got a newsletter as well, right? Yeah, we have a newsletter, Compounded Weekly, which is Compound Growth Marketing's newsletter. We talk a lot about paid acquisition, account-based marketing, and demand generation in general. 
Thank you for listening to the pod. I hope that you enjoyed the episode. If you did, I have an ask. The biggest gift that you could give me as a small business owner and as a content creator would be a review. You know the game. You can go on to Apple Podcasts. You can go on Spotify. Leave a review. That would help me service this content to other folks who are like you. Obviously, you should subscribe to the content if you really dug it. And if there's feedback that you have for me, folks you think I should chat with, stuff that you wish I would gloss over faster, whatever it is, I'm all ears. I work in growth. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I, I try to collect feedback and iterate quickly. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn at Andrew Kaplan or on Twitter at, at A Kaplan. Otherwise, hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll see you next show.